Okay, so uh, let's get started. Um, you all probably have seen me before. I'm Brendan Kidwell. Um, I've presented at New York Amateur Computer Club a few times before. And uh, tonight we are going to talk about uh, non-Silicon Valley social networking with free software. Or an alternate title I just came up with is how to do social networking as a user instead of being used. And we'll get into more of that a little bit later. Um, this presentation is licensed under Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Share Alike Version 4.0 International License. You can look up the details of that, but basically, if you have a copy of this video, please share it. Um, so uh, let's get into. Um, I I don't have like a full script, but I have uh, a few points that I want to cover, and I'm going to do a couple of demos. And uh, so this is, uh, it, this could easily just turn into a conversation. If anybody wants to interrupt me, please do. Um, so uh, let's see. Um, so I found out, um, I saw a uh, presentation by Richard Stallman. Uh, I think it was a keynote somewhere. And he mentioned um, this, let me reload this page. I just added the note. Uh, he mentioned this concept that he wrote. I don't know how old this article is, but he wrote this article called Reasons Not to Use Facebook. Let's see uh, what the date is. Probably 2019, but I don't know. Um, he complains about how Facebook is basically using you instead of you're using Facebook. They've got the advertisement that they sell. Um, they're doing all kinds of surveillance in order to do better advertisement. They're uh, censoring any... It, I don't know exactly what they're censoring, but Facebook is definitely censoring things that they don't want on their platform um, because of political sensitivities or they just don't like the topic. But it all comes down to, on all these different social networking systems, it all comes down to uh, the, what the advertisers are okay with. The advertisers don't want to pay for an ad to be on a social networking site that is along con alongside content that they consider to be not brand safe. So they lean on the social media companies and they say, we don't like that kind of content on your site. You've got to get rid of it. And um, we could go uh, on and on about uh, what, how Facebook and Twitter and Instagram work. Uh, does anybody want to add any complaints about how they feel about Facebook and Twitter? Go ahead. Um, I, I, when, when, I, when I can, I listen to Gary Null at 12 noon on BRN.FM. And um, he's been long a, uh, an advocate of uh, um, full, uh, fully informed use of vaccines. Apparently, there's a lot of junk and garbage in vaccines. And vaccination, the vaccination companies are one of the few industries where that have um, that, that are indemnified for any kind of liability. And there's there's something called a, a vaccine injury board or institution put up put up because because vaccines are going to be uh, any anything questioning vaccines is going to be deleted from Facebook and and all the all these major things. That, that's why I'm bringing yeah. this thing up. Censorship. And, um, uh, I, I, even when I went to went to law school, uh, since I, I was a geezer, so I didn't have to get a certain kind of vaccine, you know. But but they required that people of a certain age uh, had to get had to get vaccinations. Mm -hmm. So th that's an important thing. Medical medical pre you know informed and medical choice is being kind of railroaded. Out. Yeah, a lot of things are being railroaded, and feel, people feel like they don't have any control over their own uh, content on these platforms when it's supposed to be their content. Go ahead. Yeah. 
going to throw you in jail. Well, that is a huge problem on Twitter, and I'm pretty sure it's a big problem on Facebook. There's groups of people who want to talk a certain way, and they're okay with it, and then these other strangers come in and say, no, you can't talk like that here on this platform. But it's my conversation, not yours. Just, you know, live and let live. Go ahead. Um, has it managed entirely that uh, to form your own uh, communication networks? I mean... It, what's, what's the... Start over, what was the question? Is it what entirely? Has it vanished entirely? Oh, we're going to talk about how people are creating social networks that aren't under control like this. Uh, I, I remember back when when you were networked on your own. Yeah. And uh, when this club was a, a, a good nexus of a network. Mm -hmm. When we would uh, uh, have our own network, our own bulletin board, and our own stuff. There's nothing in our legal structure and in the way that the internet works that says that you can't build your own platform, set your own rules, and do whatever you want that the law says is okay. It's just that people gravitate towards these corporate platforms that are under control and have rules that have to do with advertisers and other interests that aren't your interests. Go ahead. Um, I happen to love Facebook. I was really using it. Like oh, you, you can love Facebook. That's fine. Go ahead. See when my friends are traveling, I send out my artwork, my husband's music, or I get responses from people I never even heard of. So if you want a social network, you've got to have a network out there, and that's what I'm saying. Oh yeah, definitely. And it, it, if you don't have people in your life physically, you need to reach out online or you're going to go crazy. Go ahead. Isn't there, um, isn't there a clearinghouse someplace that essentially has alternatives to all the current corporate uh, uh, meeting places? Um, I looked around uh, and for, for a list of all the different things you can try. And I have some suggestions, but I don't know if there's like a, a list that like start here for everything. Um, but, but we'll get into some suggestions along those lines in the talk. Go ahead. Yes, I teach uh, English to kids in China by computer. Mm -hmm. And I hear from them with WeChat, which is like their Facebook. Yeah. And WeChat, if you talk about privacy, there's none. Mm -hmm. But it's fascinating. I just heard from her that she came at HMR's meeting. The class should be in the week. She's in the seventh grade. I see her artwork. I see her gardening. It's a fantastic system. There are horrible things, you know, for... Yeah. WeChat has, there are rules that the, the Chinese government imposes on WeChat and says there, these are topics you can't talk about. I understand. And, no, but, but it is a great system. Yeah, it's a great system. You just have to understand you have no privacy when you use it. But other than that, it's, it, people love it. And WeChat has a, a, a money transfer option that pretty much everyone in Chinese cities uses it all the time. They, they don't use credit cards. They don't use cash. They use WeChat. And it they complete a transaction in, in less than half the time than we do with our chips. You put in the chip and you got to, the chip doesn't make contact, you got to try it again, punch in your pin, it's terrible. The WeChat is much better, the cashier shows you a QR code, you scan the QR code, your phone talks to the server, the money's transferred, no problem. Um, so anyway, let's get back into uh, the topic at hand, which is uh, what, can you want, what can you do if you don't want to use these corporate controlled systems? Um, so the big thing that I'm going to talk about is the, uh, it, it has a couple of different names, but it's basically, a lot of people call it the Fediverse, uh, F-E, let me write it down, F-E-D-I-V-E-R-S-E. -E. Um, and that refers to the fact that there's these three or four different major software platforms, which system administrators have taken upon themselves to install these platforms in either hundreds or thousands of individual nodes, servers that you can join, they might be public, they might not be, most of them are public, but you can join these individual nodes and they all talk to each other um, for the most part. Some of them uh, have banned other servers, certain servers that they don't like because they're too liberal with their free speech rules or uh, some other uh, issues that you, you can get into all kinds of heated arguments about. Uh, online, and we'll talk about heated arguments later on when we get to the uh, the staying safe and staying happy section of this talk. Um, so this is Fediverse that's built out of Mastodon is probably the biggest piece of software running it, and again there's thousands of different instances of Mastodon, just copies of the software running their own configuration, owned by an admin that has a few hundred users instead of all the users. 
Mastodon, uh, Pleroma. Let me write these down. Um, oh, I've got them written down on my wiki. So we got Mastodon and Pleroma. Uh, oh, I should say, uh, if you want to see all these resources that are on this page, that or anything that I name is probably on this page, and go to go.glump.net slash free hyphen social. That's this page right here. And by Monday, we'll have their video recording uh, linked from here. So that's the only thing you have to write down. Uh, so I was saying we've got Mastodon and Pleroma. And uh, then there's also uh, GNU Social. I didn't give it a heading, but uh, we've got GNU Social. And these are the three big software that all talk to each other. They, they can talk to each other as long as the admins allow it. Um, that speak the... Activity Pub protocol, or it's a set of protocols. I'm not sure exactly. What's the website again? Uh, the website. Sorry, I scrolled away. Go.clump.net/free-social. Um, so we got Mastodon, Pleroma, and GNU Social, and they're the sizes of the 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 number of installs is about in that order and they can all potentially talk to each other. So this is one giant network with literally hundreds of different sysadmins that have their own rules that you can actually know the sysadmin personally instead of Facebook being this you know, faceless organization that you have no control over. You can talk to the sysadmin and say, I've got a problem, I want to talk to you. And that's a really good feeling. Um, and uh, I'm going to get into a demo of uh, how do you set up a Mastodon account. I'm probably going to um, do a demo of Pleroma as well, although I've, never, I've actually never even used it. And then uh, at the end, we're going to talk about uh, IRC for a little bit. Has anybody ever heard of IRC, Internet Relay Chat? Yep. It's very different. Um, Mastodon and Pleroma and GNU Social, are they kind of look like Twitter. And... They, they all, each software has its own different default user interface, but it's basically, it, if it's like anything, it's like Twitter. IRC is a different form of communication. It's it's has some similar capabilities, but we'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, and then we'll talk about uh, how to stay happy. Uh, so everyone's got that written down. Um, let's uh, talk about Mastodon. So. Uh, why don't I just go ahead and log into my Mastodon account? And I have to give you a warning. Uh, this, the node of Mastodon that I use, called No Agenda Social, has um, th this has one of the more liberal free speech rules. So uh, a few other nodes don't like us and have banned us. But you may see some strange stuff that I haven't even seen yet when we log in and see my feed. But uh, if you do, if you see anything really bad, I apologize. I'm going to have to change my passwords when the presentation's over. So this is the default user interface for Mastodon. And uh, here we go have on the left hand side, we've got four columns. You always have these four columns. On the left hand side, we've got a posting form and a search form. And post, you can enter in text. You can upload a video or a picture. Uh, maybe an audio file, but you can only upload media files. You can't upload um, I, you, no PDF, no zip files, just media files. Um, that's the posting over there, and it's got an emoji button that I never use. Um, the second column is, this is the home column. This shows me uh, in, the, in order from the most recent to the oldest, and the, you can scroll forever to the oldest. That this is the most recent post by anybody that I'm friends with that I follow. And then over here, we've got notifications. Uh, these are threads that I have done something on that thread that somebody either replied to me or liked it or reshared it. Uh, and then on the right-hand side is more detail about whatever you choose in one of these columns. And I'll pull one of those more details now. So if I scroll down a little bit and pick a thread, um, let's see. Uh, it's like she educated herself on both sides of the issue. This probably has replies. No, it doesn't. Come on, let's find a thread where there's a reply.
Oh, an RT article. Maybe that one has one. Nope. Okay, so this one has replies. So, anybody want to guess how to pronounce that guy's name? I've been friends with him for a year and I don't know how to say it. We'll just, we'll just call him Lee. So Lee started this topic and he wrote this and he attached a picture. And then you scroll down and there's replies. And each of these messages, there's only two of them, each of them has a reply button, a boost button. That means um, reshare this. It, it, if anybody's friends with me and is not friends with Lee, it'll show up in their timeline because I shared it. That's what boost is. It's like resharing, re retweeting. Um, favorite, uh, it's kind of weird how it's called favorite, but basically this means send a quick notice to the sender of this message that I like this message. It's, it's just a, you know, good job, I like it, that's cool. And then this button has more commands. Uh, you can, if you don't like Lee, you can block him. You can report him to your system administrator. Uh, you can mute him, which I think he could still send you messages directly, but uh, I don't know, you have to look up what mute means. There's a manual somewhere. And so if I wanted to reply, I would go ahead and click reply and it will, on the left hand side, it will uh, show me the message I'm replying to and then I can type in my reply. And as long as the, the other person's name is in the message, they'll get a notification that you replied to it. Uh, in fact, if there's a lot of people in the thread and you don't want everyone to be bothered with the fact that you reply, you can cut that list down a little bit. Um, let's see. Searching. Um, Unfortunately, one of the things that Mastodon is not great at is searching for content. You, I, I found this out when I was making my notes today. You can search for a person's name or a hashtag that, you know, if somebody writes out a hashtag in a message, I spelled it wrong. If somebody writes out a hashtag, you can find those in the search, but it doesn't actually index the rest of the message. So if I search for Apollo, I'm not gonna find this message. Um, and the only way around that is you just got to check up on your feed once in a while and just don't be anxious about the messages that you didn't read. Just, it's, it's like a, you know, walking into a bar, staying for a while, and then walking out of a bar. There's things that didn't happen when you weren't there, you, that you weren't there. Um, and what else do we have? You can, um, oh... So everything I've shown you so far, except for maybe some friends that appeared on other servers, uh, is mostly been in the context of my server. This is no agenda social. I mean, I don't own it, I, I use it. There, and I mentioned the federation where all the servers are connected to each other. So if you're brand new at this and you don't have any friends, the first thing you wanna do is go to the federated timeline of your server and it's gonna show you this fire hose that never stops loading. And it's gonna keep on showing more messages every couple of seconds, somebody's gonna post something. This is every message in the world that my server knows about. It might not be on my server, but it's, it's every message that my server knows exists. It shows up here and you can scroll down here. So what you do when you're brand new and you don't have any friends is you look through the world timeline and say, oh, that's kind of interesting, I like this one, so I'm gonna I'm gonna open this message, you click on the message to open it, and then say that you wanna follow this person. Um, I think I have to click on the name of the person, coin Y. And then I can say, I like this message, so I'm gonna follow this person. And then they'll show up in your home timeline, which is over on the first column over here. And the uh, discovering friends, that brings up an interesting point that I wanted to make at some point. Unfortunately, because Facebook and Twitter and Instagram are the way that they are, and just about any system, you can't use this system to talk to people on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram. It's just, it's not gonna happen. You can't talk to Twitter users on Facebook anyway, so it's just, it, it's a different system, but this is a much more open and expansive system that anybody can plug into. Uh, so when you're starting out, uh, you can either do what I just said about uh, looking through the public timeline and just pick messages from people that seem interesting and follow those people and start replying to those people. Or you can convince some of your real world, real world friends or relationships you already have, bring them out to dinner and say, 
you got to try this new system that, I've got, that I'm on. It's really cool. It's called the, the Fediverse. It's got the software called Mastodon. And then give them the whole speech that I'm doing right now. And say, we're not leaving until you join that system and be friends with me so that I know somebody on it. Um, but you don't have to do it that way. Go ahead. Stuff on. Yeah. Um, th that's has to be that. the, 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 anytime you see sensitive content, like right here, I'm not going to click on it. Um, this tag came from the person who sent the message. Oh. So you can create a message and then say, I understand that some people might not want to see this right away. They'll have to click on it. Um, you do that with the uh, so content. So they could put sensitive stuff up. Yeah. And not put that. You can post a message and say, I know this might be offending people, and I'm going to warn them before they see it. But the only person who can do that is the sender of the message. Right. And, so if, care, and if you see something that doesn't have the tag and you don't like it, you've got to either ignore it or block that person, or it, it's all on you. Okay. Just You've got to react to it the way that you want to. Don't get angry about it, because everybody has their own opinions. But um, the administrator is not involved. The network is not involved. It's just the, the sender says... That was my question. Yeah. So somebody was filtering the uh, content. Yep. Uh, so the, it's a little bit of a free-for-all. It, exactly. It's, it's supposed to be a free-for-all. Now, some of the other servers that are not the server that I am, I'm on No Agenda Social, some of the other servers um, get the admins are really uptight, and it's basically like another Facebook, where they don't want you talking about everything. There's topics they don't want you talking about. And they, they, they see every interaction that has some friction as somebody did something wrong and you you know my policy is if there's friction just there's friction try to smooth it out but there are people who think that if there's friction somebody did something wrong and they have to be sanctioned and uh, if you're on a server like that and you don't like it you might want to pick another server go ahead Um, it's very hard to count. I think most nodes will publish how many subscribers they have. And there is a website that collects that data into a giant graph, and it looks really scary. Um, but I don't know what that is. I don't know how to find that right now. Uh, I'll post it on the notes page next week if I do find it. But also you could just Google for um, Mastodon network, nap, network map or Fediverse network map. And you'll probably find some maps and statistics and stuff. Uh, it, there's thousands of servers, and every server has at least one or two people on it. Most of them have hundreds, uh, so it's a lot of people. Um, well, I, I'm sure there's a lot of really small servers, but there are servers that have like over 100,000 users. It's it's pretty big. Um, so, let's see. No. But it, every there, there may be some instances you have to pay to be on, but that's very rare. And uh, most of the instances are either self-funded, they just somebody's got enough money to run a server and they just do it, or they put a big donation button on their homepage and say, if you want this thing to keep running, you've got to give me money. Somebody's got to give me money. And usually enough people donate or the users migrate over to someone who has more resources. But the software is all free. Anybody can take that software and build their own instance of it. And the people that run the instances are just responsible for finding money in their own way. And it doesn't really cost very much. If you have like a dozen users, this could cost you about $5 a month. And it's only when you get into like thousands of users that you need more resources and it costs a pretty penny to keep that server running. Uh, was there another question over here? Yeah. But then we, we never really got, you know, not got it where 100,000 or a million people are calling it. The, right. the bare minimum these days for a rented virtual machine running Unix is about, or, or Linux, is about $5 a month. And if I'm not mistaken, without a lot of users, Mastodon will run on that $5 a month. If you wanted to set up your own, I highly recommend you do it. It's a lot easier than setting up a mail server, but it isn't easy. Mail servers are. A disaster. How long have you been using this? Uh, this instance was set up about 
and, and this is being recorded on YouTube, so I, I, I'm probably going to say this wrong, but it's, it's probably three years old, and about six months after it was created, I probably joined it, something along like that. The software is probably about three, three and a half years old. We, we were one of the early adopters. Go ahead. Uh, ultimately, what's the use of this? For example, when there used to be, uh, I guess... Um, uh, what's the use of Twitter? EBS chat things. Mm -hmm. I think there were foundations uh, funded by the telephonic industry to show that so you see uh, uh, government, uh, we need, there, there's so much chatter going on in these wires, this is why you need to, you need to get behind it as a government to fund this. Mm -hmm. what, what's the ultimate ripple of effect or benefit that uh, someone would support this other than just a forum for, the, for liberal free, free thinkers? It's really just everyone who's paying for it is just they want it to exist. Mm -hmm. And they, they want to have something that works kind of like Twitter and Facebook that is controlled by somebody a lot closer to them, if not that person themselves. Go ahead. Uh, somebody's spreading, uh, somebody's probably using it to spread misinformation about Greek mythology. Oh, yeah. Well, remember all that stuff I said about nobody controls this? You, you have to remember what that means. Any message you see on here is the it's the property and the responsibility of that one person that posted it. And if they're lying to you, you've got to figure out or just ignore them. And how do we know there aren't a lot of bots on there? Uh, bots tend to get banned pretty quickly, and uh, they they you'll only ever see a bot in the uh, world timeline unless you actually subscribe to it. And there are some bots that, of course, you want to subscribe to, like um, I think this one is probably a bot, uh, Bitcoin fees. This yeah. is connected to a database and it's posting a message every hour or whatever. And if you're interested in that kind of thing, you can just subscribe to it, it shows up in your feed. So, you know, you can pay attention to the bots, ignore them, whatever. Uh, there, there's a flag to say this account is a bot, and then the users can uh, do something with that or not. But um, a, a bot that's trying to say something bad to you is really no different than a person that's trying to say something bad, other than the bot has a, a lot more attention to time to spend on it. And you just have to filter every message in your head, like, what do I think of this message? What does it mean? If I think that it's true, why do I think that it's true? It, you've got to go through that critical thinking. Go ahead, Kevin. That search, does that, does that allow for the sifting out bots or not? Uh, yeah, it, you can, when you create a bot and you create an account for that bot, you can declare this is a bot. That's, that's one of the flags on the, uh, the, your profile. And then the people that interact with you over the network, that see your profile, that see your messages, they can take that flag and do whatever they want with it. Um, and there are some instances in the network that might say no bot messages at all. And anybody that says that they're a bot isn't going to appear on that server. But that's pretty rare. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, it's just, it's free for all. And, and, of course, somebody could be a bot and not say that they're a bot. And you've got to figure that out for yourself. And if you don't like them, block them. Uh, what about viruses, worms, Trojan horses? Well, as I said in the beginning, you can't share anything besides text and media. So pictures, videos, and sounds. Um, and you can only share the formats that aren't uh, the kind of things that you can include a virus in. But you could, of course, link to a page that, where you can download a virus. Um, and that's the same as reading anything on the web. It's just I'm, I'm going to another resource, and I need to make sure that my browser is up to date and my computer is secure, and uh, anything that I don't like the look of it, don't download it, et cetera. Uh, it's no different than Twitter. Go ahead. Uh, only in it, it it does not support HTML content. So the only exploits that you could possibly get are either in the pictures, it, it, it it's very rare for it to be. I, I can't remember the last time there was an exploit in a picture format, but there there are some video formats that could have an exploit. But I think they're pretty much locked down. Anything your browser will play, it's probably pretty secure at this point if it tries to play it. Uh, that's um, we're not talking about Flash. This doesn't support Flash. You can't post Flash on here. You've got to go somewhere else to do Flash. Um, but anything that's not Flash and that's video is usually not a problem. You can. Uh, I'm going to look at my notes for a second. You can wave your hand if you got another question. 
Uh, I covered all my notes on here. I talked about blocking, following. Um, we could go through the account setup process, but I think that would just, you know, um, what we actually want to talk about next is uh, finding a Mastodon server. How do you pick which one you want to start on? Um, and then once you pick one of those, the sign-up process is pretty self-explanatory. We're not going to go over that. But I have um, a page here of instances.social is a list of Mastodon instances. And um, it's a long story why no agenda social isn't on here, but I'd search for it and it's not. It has to do with that extreme free speech kind of policy. But um, you can go here to instances.social and say start. And it's going to say, what languages do you speak? And you can put in one or two or whatever you, or whatever you want. Uh, I'm just going to leave English. And then say next. And then would you prefer to have a really small instance or a really big instance or you don't care how big it is? And you can say, well, I'd rather have, I, I want to be friendly with the sysadmin. So let's see, how, let's show me instances that are less than 100 users. And what do you think about the uh, rules locally on that instance that you might join? Do you care about any of these kinds of rules? Um, allowed, forbidden, don't care. I'm going to leave these all blank. But these are attributes that are published in the server's profile. And then this site collects all those into one database. And then, uh, so those are my search terms. And we've got, uh, does it even say how many it found? Well, it found, it found a, several pages of uh, servers that you can join uh, based on, and you can just look at the title and the, whatever this field is, generalistic, and then the, uh, w the description after it, how many users, uh, statuses, these are messages, how many times since the server was created, how many messages have been posted on that server. So if you find one that's got 10 messages on it, it's probably brand new. It may die before you even move in. Uh, you probably want something that has a little bit of longe longevity to it. But you can go through and pick one random one based on the description or just random. Go ahead. What? It's, it's all over the world. It's, it's just on the internet. It, it, the software is free. You can, the, all these different sysadmins downloaded it and installed it on their server, which may be anywhere. It might tell you where it is, it might not. Go ahead. I have a question. I thought you selected uh, uh, English language, and it looks like there are some foreign language uh, sites in the results there, so I was just curious yep. about that. Uh, well, remember what we said several times free for all. This is based on data that's published on the server's homepage that uh, the sysadmin may or may not have set correctly. So they could speak German, and it could be the default, and it says, we only speak English here. So um, you just have to decide, you have to figure that out when you find something. So it's not a perfect filter, even if you ask for English. It's all up to the participants to make the data good. Yeah, these all talk to each other. So you can join any one of them, for the most part. You can join any one of them and see the entire network. Although the messages that you'll see in the world timeline, they're all going to be different depending on where you are and when the messages arrive. But you can join any one of these and talk to anybody on the entire network. Oh, so it's all the same? Yeah, it's all one network. Oh. You can follow somebody on another server, and whenever you post, that person on the other server is going to get a notice that says you posted something. Uh, because the, the idea is that there's no centralized control, and the opposite of centralized control is everybody does their own thing. So there, there, is, there are a few servers that are really, really popular that have hundreds of thousands of users on them, and you can pick one of those. Now, why are they more popular than the others? Um, because they were first, or they have better marketing, or friends joined in that server. Um, I don't know. It's, it's complicated. Um, but anybody can set one up. You can join a really big server, you can join a really small one. It, uh, it shouldn't really matter in general, except in the case where you're on a server that other servers think that you're too liberal and they might ban you. Um, so that's basically how you find a server. Um, it's a completely different identity. If you get banned from a server and kicked off, if you join another server, no one knows who you are. So, and please don't use that as an excuse to go around and harass people on the entire network. 
but um, it, there, there's, no, there's no central administration. There's no central identity. Uh, you don't create a public key when you join and then have to give that public key when you start on another server. Every server is a different identity. Every, every time you, you create an account on a server, it's different from anywhere else that you might have done it. And you can actually have multiple accounts if you want. Um, a reason you might want to create multiple accounts on different servers is you could join a server that is all about bird watching, and then you can look at the local timeline, whether you follow people or not. I don't know if I showed, but um, there is, where's the local timeline? Local timeline, I skipped that one. So this is all the messages that anyone on my server has posted, whether I follow them or not. So you could join a bird watching server and follow that local timeline of people you haven't yet followed. And you could join a uh, Linux and IT server uh, that, and look at their local timeline. So some of these servers are topic specific and you might see those in the Mastodon instances list uh, or they might be general. Um, this uh, one is apparently about, these, these are general, general. This one's about pipes. I don't know what that means, but it's about pipes pipe collecting and pipe smoking. So if you're really interested in that, you can join that server and see what all the 53 subscribed users are talking about even before you follow them. Okay. But you could follow the other servers even if you're on the pipe server. Yeah. You if you don't know who exists on the other servers, you can go to that, um, go back to that world timeline, the show me everything timeline. And after you follow people on another server, you're automatically going to get their messages showing up in your my timeline. And the, the, the servers talk to each other and say that A is subscribed to B. Make sure you let me know whenever something happens, and it, it, they all propagate. Okay. Yeah? But there's something called uh, Yahoo. Yeah, Yahoo Groups. Yahoo Groups, yeah. But they may even have a pipe. Uh, so this is just another sort of another way of just meeting people with similar interests. Yeah, exactly. It's similar to Yahoo groups or Google groups, which used to be used to that. Right, and Google groups is did they close Google Google groups yet? That 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 was formerly uh, Usenet groups, I believe. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, well, Usenet was another decentralized, completely federated network, but it had more of a structure, and it had there was like a. There was this nebulous governing body on Usenet, and uh, you probably want, if you want to know all about Usenet, I would recommend look at the writings of um, Eric S. Raymond. I know he's written something about how Usenet used to work. Um, but what Google Groups did with Usenet is somebody else created an archive of every message that ever existed on Usenet, going back to like the 1980s. Google bought that archive and then provided Usenet reading and writing services on top of that. Yeah, Deja News. That became the archive in Google Groups. And um, I believe you can create non-Usenet groups on Google Groups if it still exists, otherwise it's dead. Um, so Usenet was federated, but at the same time there, was, there, were, there were rules and a lot of people didn't understand it. I can't tell you how it worked, but there was some kind of authority to uh, who could create a Usenet group and how they were propagated. However, the protocol that Usenet used called NNTP, uh, you'll see NNTP in your email program. It probably has a join an NNTP server. Anybody can set up a non-federated NNTP server. And I'm not going to search for it, but uh, Steve Gibson, grc.com, um, he's the guy that created uh, SQRL login and um, shields up and uh, What's it called? Um, what's that? Did, uh, Hank, that, that, that tool that fixes dead hard drives from grc.com. What was that big tool? That doesn't matter. Anyway, uh, grc.com is an is a interesting software development shop that's basically just Steve Gibson. My point is he has his own NNTP server, which is the same protocol as Usenet, but it doesn't federate with anything. It's just if you want to see the messages on his server, you've got to lo log into his server. So it's non-federated. So, federated federated in, in the t context of networking, federated means you've got a bunch of different nodes that have subscribers, and the nodes all talk to each other so that subscribers can see messages that came from another node. 
you, if you set up a non-federated NTP server or a non-federated Mastodon server, then the only messages you'll ever see on that server are the ones that came from that server's users. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so that's how you, uh, how you find a Mastodon server is either you join the one that I use, which is noagendasocial.com, or you go to instances.social and you pick one at random and if you don't like it, try to pick another one. And when you go to that server, just uh, it, it'll have a home page and say, we run Mastodon, and here's the sign up form. Uh, I don't know what I just did. There we go, go to instance. And it will eventually load and say, uh, you are a new user, you've got to fill out this form over here on the left. Uh, oh, it doesn't say it on the catalog, but muddle.us is not accepting new members. Uh, you might have to click around a couple of different servers before you find one that doesn't say that. But it should give you a sign-up form and you just fill it out, answer your email, that sort of thing. So the other big software that the Fediverse uses is called Pleroma. And I don't know much about it except that I've received messages from Pleroma instances. But the big selling point of Pleroma is that Pleroma is not Mastodon. And that may not seem significant, but uh, if you've seen a lot of different social networking sites, and if you're looking at this, you might say, who designed that? <laughs> That's really terrible. It's confusing. I don't know what to do with it. All these buttons are confusing me. I'm lost. Pleroma has a completely different layout that uses the same network format for all the sharing of messages, but it presents it in a different way. And I'm not actually familiar with how it looks. I've just been told by other people it's better. So if you don't like Mastodon or if you want to try both, you can try out Pleroma. And it's the same kind of setup where Pleroma is free software. Uh, hundreds of different sysadmins have downloaded it, installed it on their own server, and then opened it up to the world and say, join my server. And Pleroma has a list of instances. And I don't know how complete this is, but there's uh, quite a number of instances listed on here. And most of them don't have much of a description. So try it. Let me know how it goes. Uh, do you want to talk about IRC for a little bit? OK. So IRC. Um, let me go ahead and log in. Oh yeah. Did you find a lot of information on this kind of thing on your YouTube, or is there that you know? I actually had no time this week to prepare. <laughs> but yes, there's a lot of information on YouTube. So uh, let me hide. Uh, let's see. Hide. Hide Nick changes. Hide mode changes. I'll just put up something that has some messages. Has anybody said anything in this channel? All right, let's try another channel. Uh, OK, I, this is the support channel for Zen Desktop Wiki. I'll just display this while I'm, I'll explain, while I'm explaining IRC. So IRC goes back to, I'm going to say 1991 or so. Um, the world found out about IRC when, uh, during the first Gulf War, or um, Bush 1's Gulf War. That was in the 90s, right? Or was it in the 80s? Early 90s. So during Bush 1's uh, Gulf War, there was not a lot of news coming out in the early stages of it. People didn't know what was going on. And the way that a lot of the world found out about breaking stories was some people that knew stuff were in IRC, on an, in an IRC channel, sharing information. And then reporters found out about this and re re contacted those people, and that's how they got some information. Um, because, uh, you know, it's this worldwide network. There's, there's no, uh, you don't have to worry about um, broadcast rules or radio or TV or satellite stuff. It's just people talking on the internet. Um, so what IRC is, is uh, it doesn't... It stands for Internet Relay Chat. Yeah, Internet Relay Chat, thank you. 
IRC does not store messages. It only forwards messages. So this is really like that bar room that you walk into and then walk out of and you don't know what's going on when you're not there. It, when we have these old messages because I use software called Quassel, which is partly running on my computer and partly running on a server on the internet. And so my IRC session is out on the internet and never gets turned off because I like it that way. I like to see what people have said. And then my desktop connects to my personal server and says, show me the current session of all the things that I'm logged into. But IRC at its core, all it does is say, it let people connect to a server and then say, this is my name. And then uh, you can join channels. And when you're in a channel, anytime somebody says a message, all the people that are in the channel receive a copy of that message. That's literally all IRC does. And it does private messages as well, one-to-one -one person. Um, Just like the chat yeah, chat rooms. And generally, anybody can create a chat room on most networks. You, you just create, you just join a channel that doesn't exist, and you created the channel. That's all. And usually, there is a system on that network that lets you register ownership of a new channel, and, and you can control it that way. But we're not going to get into all the details. But it's not a bulletin board. It's it's just live chat. In separated into channels. The channels exist on networks. The networks are made up of federated servers, but then there's lots of different networks that are distinct from each other, and usually the servers on a network are all owned by the same entity. They're just in different geograph geographic locations. Uh, so that's a lot of words. But um, where am I going with this? So uh, when you start using IRC, you've got to pick a network. Uh, you get to know that it exists, or you can look in a catalog, which I'll show you in a moment. And then you join that network, and then uh, you may or may not want to register your username so that you can control that user uh, forever. And then you pick some channels. And uh, the network can tell you a list of channels if there aren't too many channels. Um, but there's also catalogs of channels that you can search through. And then when, once you join channels, you just leave it running. And either you start a conversation or somebody else does. And when you want to talk, you, want, you talk. The channels are not general. The channels usually have a specific topic. There's, some networks will have a few general channels. This channel that I'm in is the support channel for Zim Desktop Wiki, which I talked about in the club um, last year, I think. So uh, let's go over to, um, let me show you a catalog of IRC resources. We'll pick a network and pick a few channels, and then I'll show you how to set it up from scratch. Because this, this is a little more involved than Mastodon. So there's a site called netsplit.de. Uh, the DE is Germany. And netsplit is a list of all publicly known, publicly accessible networks and channels. And the channels all belong to one network. You can't have a, a channel in multiple networks. And there's a few really big IRC networks and lots and lots of little ones. And I think over on the right hand side, there's this little widget. IRCnet is the biggest IRC network. Um, and for descriptions of these really big ones, you can probably find them on Wikipedia, and they'll tell you what it's about. But they're, they're all pretty general. Um, I think even QuakeNet is probably, Quake was created for the game Quake, but it's probably got everything on it now. Um, free software projects and free information projects and uh, things that go along with free and libre culture uh, generally end up on Freenode, where this channel is on Freenode that I'm in. And um, Freenode's one of the big ones. I'd, does it even show up in that top 10? I guess not. Oh, no, it's the, very, it's the uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. It's about the 10th uh, most popular one. So um, that's the networks. Now, you can pick a network, and then it'll show you the list of channels on the network. Uh, it doesn't... Oh, it, it has a... Whenever you log in, the network says whatever it wants to say in this message of the day, and you can read that on uh, netsplit.de without actually logging into that IRC server if you want. Um, but you can browse the channels. Now, you can either pick a network and then... Why did it get light? Uh -huh. Yep. 
I, 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 hit, I hit the conference button. We're good. Where was I? Uh, so you can pick an IRC network and then go to the channels tab and browse the channels. You can search channels, but you could also say, I don't even know what network I want to join. You can just go straight to IRC channels. And this is all the channels that the site knows about on all the different networks. And if I go in here and search for a Zim desktop wiki, I should find my channel. Uh, and there it is. So if you want to join a conversation about a topic, this is a good way to do it. Just search for that topic in channels. Chances are, if, if it's general enough, you're going to find people talking about that, that topic. And so you're going to find a channel, and it's going to tell you, and this gray is going to tell you what network it's on. That's the network you've got to join in order to get onto that channel. So let's, um, without picking another one, let's just say that I'm a new user and I want to join that channel. How do I do that? So um, ZimWiki is on Freenode, so I want to go to the Freenode page. And then in the about here, it should have a home page here somewhere. Um, web chat. Oh, okay, what you're looking for is web chat. Uh, go, to the t go to that tab, and it'll go ahead and open it up in a browser. So you don't even need to install anything. Um, if you start from netsplit.de and click on web chat on any of the networks, uh, it'll let you just um, log in from here using a uh, browser. Oh, I don't want Java. Okay, I'm in the wrong place. Sorry about that. What I'm going to do is just look for the homepage of Freenode by searching in my uh, DuckDuckGo. So we know we want to join the network Freenode. And if you go to the homepage, most networks are going to somewhere on the, they're going to have a link that opens up uh, a web-based chat client so that you don't have to install anything. And on Freenode, it's just that giant button that says chat. And then I can type in my username. And just pick anything. If you pick a username that somebody else is using, immediately after you log in, it's going to say, hey, you can't do that. Somebody else is using this username. You've got to pick something else. Actually, let's demonstrate that. And you write in, you uh, plug in the channel that you want to join and say, I'm not a robot. And I'm probably going to have to click on traffic lights, cars, cars, cars. Somebody said the other day that this takes a lot longer to do in Firefox than it does to do in Chrome. Yeah, yeah you've got you to answer more of these. Uh, if, you're, if you're not using Chrome, if you are using Chrome, it only asks you once. If you're using Firefox, three or four times. I wonder why that happens. Okay, let me in with only one. Okay, so somewhere in here it's going to say uh, we can't, we don't like your username because, uh, let's see, who am I? Ah, okay, so the system picked a new username for me. I, I'm actually bkidwell underscore instead of just bkidwell. And that happened because the name that I picked was used by myself in this other window. <coughs> So uh, you can keep trying different names until you come up with something that works that, that's really unique. And I'm going to go ahead and log in as I'm going to log in as Nyack B Kidwell. And I have to find cars again. For some reason, it didn't join the channel for me. Oh, okay, the next line. ZimWiki cannot, you cannot join this channel because you're not identified with services. And if you're on Freenode, that's probably going to happen a lot because um, there was a lot of spam on Freenode last year. It got really, really bad. And one of the things that they did, some channel owners did this for a while, and then um, the entire network, I think, did it at one point. It may still be in place. 
you have to be registered and logged in with a password in order to join a channel. They want somebody who's who went through a few steps and they're not just a, a spam bot. Uh, it's unfortunate and it's a pain, but that's the way it works. And I wanted to I wanted to show that that's a problem and don't be put off by it. There's just a few more steps you've got to learn. And it's really weird and confusing if you've never done it by yourself. Uh, if you want to get into this, I highly recommend you read, um, I think NetSplit has a how-to somewhere on, linked off the homepage. Uh, I will try to add an IRC how-to to the notes page for this talk that's on go.glump.net slash free social. Um, but basically what you got to do is uh, start a conversation with a user called NickServe, which is actually a service. And you're going to say query slash query NickServe. And that, it, it can be all lowercase, it doesn't matter. So the slash query NickServe, that says I want to talk one-on-one -on -one with NickServe. And this is the service and I can talk to it right away. I can say help. And then I want to say register. So help register. And then it's going to say, uh, in order to register, you want to say, uh, the, the syntax is register, and then password. Let's type in the password that I created already. Uh, and then the email address. Um, Let's just put in my email address. An email containing a password has been sent. Let's see what that says. I could be Kidwell, yada, yada, yada. I need to type in this verification code. Uh, verify, register, Nyack, P. Kidwell, R. F. R. A. Z. D. J. K. I. C. J. B. And of course, this code only works once. Uh, invalid. Let's try it again. R. F. R. A. Z. D. J. K. I. C. J. B. Okay, I'm not having a good day. But assuming you actually got through this process and it doesn't reject the code that was in your email, uh, I don't know why it's not working, but don't worry about it. Um, then uh, once that works, then all you have to, once it's, if NickServe says that you're registered, then you can just go ahead and try joining the channel again. J slash join pound zim wiki. You gotta put a pound in front of the channel name. I'm going to do that now, but it's, if I go back to the status window, it's going to say, no, 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 you're not registered. But um, that's an overview of it. Uh, obviously, you're not going to, unless you're highly technical, you're not going to figure it out just from what I said so far. But that's really as complica complicated as it gets. And if you look around on the internet for how-tos, you'll find a better explanation than I just gave you in the last 10 minutes. And... Um, so you can use most IRC networks without installing anything at all. You just use this web-based client. Uh, of course, it doesn't have as many features as a desktop full native application. And there's a lot of applications you can use for that. Uh, I mentioned on my notes page, I like Quassel. Um, it's pretty easy to install Quassel in a one-person kind of mode, no remote server. Um, if you want to do the store session on a remote server thing, you can do that too. Uh, HexChat is a really basic IRC client that works on all the different uh, desktops, Windows, Mac OS, Linux. And if you don't like those two, you can go to alternative2 slash software slash HexChat, and it'll show you lots of other choices you can use. Um, so, go ahead. Did, did people have other questions before? I, I, you, you can go ahead, Michael, and then <coughs> do we have more? It depends on the channel and it depends on the network. Um, most channels on most networks will let you read and write messages without registering. 
but because Freenode was subject to that spam attack last year, they locked it down so that in order to join any channel, in order to even see the messages, you have to be registered. Uh, only if the, there may be a bot in the channel that records every message and then puts it on a web page. If nobody is doing that, then no, Google doesn't pay attention to it. Okay. But you have to assume anywhere that didn't really have a big barrier to entry, if, if you can anonymously join the server and, and type on it, you have to assume that somebody in that channel is recording everything and is going to publish it. Don't assume otherwise. Yeah. Because they're frequently used, mm -hmm. and, and, and they tend to uh, sort of, you know, uh, 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 go away when, when they're not. And the, so somebody mentioned earlier about Usenet, you know, not Usenet, otherwise known as NetNews, used to be like the internet yeah. back in the days before the World Wide Web became a part of the internet. Right. And that was like one of the greatest things, you know, since I spread. And, and, and nowadays, people don't even talk about it because... Anytime you want to get information, you just get on Google, mm -hmm. and Google will, will not only find information that is on Usenet, but yep. also on any other website. Yeah. So, so therefore, it sort of makes it almost makes Usenet sort of obsolete. Mm -hmm. The same argument goes for these, you know, channels and, and, and whatnot. And, and the, the the point is like, if, if they require you have to go through all this this onerous process of registering, you know, it. it, it basically shoot themselves on the foot because people don't bother with them. And, and if, if you can't find it through Google, then nobody even knows that they exist. Yeah, and that's, that is all true, yes. And I believe at the moment, anything that you post in a Pleroma instance or a Mastodon instance is probably, even though it's publicly available, because of the way that you have to be on the network to find the URL for it, unless you share it someone else, somewhere else. I don't believe that Google and Bing and, and uh, the others index all the messages on Pleroma and Mastodon servers. They can. If they can find them, they can index them, but I don't believe that they do. Um, the whole point of these uh, decentralized social networks, that the, the currently the IRC and Mastodon and Pleroma and anything else that works like these, is it's talking, it's for now. It's what's in the moment, what people are talking about now. And you either participate or you don't participate. And you have to assume at the same time that somebody might be recording everything, but you have to also assume that you're not going to find it later. And if you want to find it later, you've got to save it yourself. And if you want another, a search engine to find it for you, unfortunately, it's not going to. Um, so I just had a few more remarks about um, how to, I, I teased this at the beginning, how to stay safe and more importantly, how to stay happy when you're using social networking. Um, you, you know that one of the reasons that I'm doing this talk uh, is obviously there's a lot of angst over censorship and uh, all kinds of other issues with Facebook and Twitter and how they're controlled corporately. But there's also anxiety caused by just people interacting with each other online that for the most part are strangers, especially if you're on one of these networks where the, you, you joined it by yourself without any friends probably. Everyone you're talking to is at the moment now, they're strangers. When you're talking to strangers online, it's really easy to get into this uh, loop of somebody said something that you don't like, and then you've got to respond to it. You've got to correct it. You've got to tell them that, you know, I don't like that. You can't talk like that. And I personally feel that you should live and let live in these, in these sorts of instances. Um, respect other people's opinions, as long as they're not doing anything that is like, wildly immoral, or, and of course that depends on your definition of morality, but I like to lean on, is it legal? If, what they're t if it's legal to be discussing what they're discussing, I don't care. You can talk about anything you want. And if you have that attitude, and you just don't respond to things you don't like, don't reply, if you really don't like a person, you can block them, you'll never see them again, um, you're, you're going to be much more happy uh, and not have so much anxiety about it. Just don't pay attention to the things that you don't like. And if somebody is getting all in your face and doing that same thing to you, like, I don't like your messages and whatever, just 
stop talking to them. Don't respond. You don't have to respond. And you certainly don't have to respond now. You can say, somebody sent this reply directly to me and it's upset me. I'm going to wait until tomorrow to respond to it. I don't have to respond to it now. I could never respond if I don't want to. Um, and that uh, goes into my next point, take breaks. If you are using this stuff all the time, if you have, if you leave Mastodon running in a browser window uh, when you're at work, and whenever somebody mentions me in a message, I get a little toaster pop up in the corner of my screen. Hey, Lee said something. Uh, he, he replied to you. If you got those pop-ups coming up every, uh, you know, every few minutes all day, it's just it, it's information overload. Log out of the network when you're not using it. And log in for a few minutes or an hour, whatever is the right amount. And then say, okay, I'm done with social networking for now. I'll come back to it tomorrow. You'll be happier, I promise. And don't have notifications turned on. If you install a Mastodon client on your phone, first thing you do, go into settings and say, don't tell me about anything. I don't want to know about any Mastodon messages unless I'm in Mastodon looking at the feed. No flashing lights, no sounds, no vibrating. It all just causes anxiety, believe me. And uh, that's my tips and that's my talk. Any more questions before we adjourn?